Welcome to the Archetypal Mosaic. This is an exclusive episode with His Royal and Imperial Highness Archduke Dr. Geza von Habsburg. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'd like to read uh, Dr. Habsburg's bio for the audience because it is exquisite. Um, as I mentioned, His Royal and Imperial Highness Dr. Geza von Habsburg is an internationally renowned expert on Fabergé and has curated and published extensively on the subject. With a PhD in art history, he has more than 40 years of experience in Russian art, old master paintings, European porcelain, silver and gold, and objects of virtu. Uh, Dr. Habsburg has published 14 books, curated six major exhibitions, attracting more than 2 million visitors, acts as an expert at international airfares, including Tafaf, and lectures worldwide at museums and universities. Fluent in seven languages, Dr. Habsburg spent his early career in Europe as chairman of Christie's Europe and as chairman of Habsburg Fine Art International Auctioneers. He was recently appointed visiting professor at Okayama University in Japan and acts as guest curator of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, where he organized the 2011 exhibition Fabergé Revealed. Dr. von Habsburg is the great-great-grandson of Emperor Franz Joseph of Austria, also King of Hungary, and grandson of King Frederick Augustus II of Saxony. Wow. What an extraordinary life you've led. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you make it sound extraordinary. Uh, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Although we began, uh, I began my life as a refugee and uh, we left Hungary in 1944 when the Russians invaded our country, lost everything, were basically paupers for the next 20 years. Uh, but um, I have not regretted one single moment. I uh, have a PhD in history of art and archaeology and uh, consider myself actually really very lucky to have led such a charmed life in spite of having lost everything previously. What was it like to be at a university in Switzerland? How was that experience? Uh, well, Switzerland was only the beginning because I actually went on from there to Munich University and then to Florence. So I have a really uh, very um, international background. And um, it, Fribourg University, where I went to, was tiny compared to all the, the colleges and universities in the United States. I think we were a dozen people studying art history and the uni whole university may have comprised, I don't know, 3,000 students only. Wow. Um, let me ask you this question. What does it feel like to be a royal? <laughs> a question that I'm always asked. Uh, it feels like nothing uh, that uh, one can talk about. I mean, basically, I'm down to earth. That's how we were brought up, knowing full well that uh, we had to earn our living, my younger brother and I. And uh, we, were, we do have a large family gatherings, um, and uh, usually in Austria or in, in Hungary. So uh, those are wonderful, but um, to be a royal doesn't really doesn't really mean very much unless one takes it very seriously and its responsibilities, which means if you have children and I have uh, four children, three sons and a daughter, um, you have to pass on to them responsibilities which maybe not every normal uh, human being has. We're all very religious, we're all Catholic. Um, that is something that we pass on. And uh, we all have a high sense of morals and ethics. Um, which we also try to pass on uh, to our children. 
So it's more a responsibility than a pleasure to be a royal nowadays. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, let me ask you this. You were a visiting professor at Okayama University in Japan. I've been to Japan and I love it so much. There is such a correlation between Japanese... Uh, the, the refinement of their art and also Fabergé's refinement. Did you feel that connection? Did it inspire you? Uh, I have lectured on Fabergé. Uh, I, 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 I hold two kinds of lecture. One to uh, undergraduates and one to the public, large public uh, lectures. Um, I do have to admit that I have problems uh, in as far as I speak English, no Japanese, sadly. Um, I have uh, interpreters who try to understand. I mean, I send them my texts in advance. They try to understand what I'm saying. The students have no clue about what I am talking about. There is a certain lack of uh, culture, the, the time of, type of culture that we talk about European culture. Mm -hmm. They know very little about it. They do not speak any languages uh, or virtually none. So it's 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 quite a problem to to teach them. Uh, but on the other hand, as you quite rightly point out, they are highly sensitive, um, wonderful people, and I enjoy my. Uh, my years or my my studies, uh, my teachings in Japan, very much indeed. I look forward to it every year. Now, please uh, share the seven languages that you speak. Well, born Hungarian, mother German. Uh, we lived in Portugal for ten years. Uh, you have that. I lived in Italy for two years. Uh, French. I lived in Geneva for ten years. I'm not sure how far we are Spanish because I love Spanish literature and I've always uh, studied it. Not sure what's what's missing still. Well, definitely there's fantastic English as well. Um, now your um, your great great grandfather as well as. Uh, King Frederick Augustus. I want to ask you this question. Sayus Trioch Imperatorov. So, the three the, the three emperors league between Russia, Germany, and your great grandfather. Can you describe that? Uh, you are asking me difficult uh, historic questions. Uh, that uh, are we speaking now of the eighteen twelve? Um, um, uh, events where Alexander the First and Emperor Francis the First, and uh, at that time there was no Emperor of Germany, but uh, Emperor Napoleon. That was one of the um, um, uh, tripartite uh, meetings of of, of Royal, which you are referring to. Which I'm one? In referring to the one where your great grandfather. Uh, Emperor Franz Joseph, as along with um, the Russian and German emperors, together unified. I just wanted to know what, if there was an experience that came out of that that was passed down um, about any kind of uh, I don't know special, you know, friendship or power or anything of that sort. Uh, well, uh, uh, the Austrian and German emperors were uh, cousins. Uh, so they were uh, related. Um, the Russian emperor was also a cousin uh, at Nicholas II. So they, 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 they were all related. But in the end, uh, if we're talking now of 1914, uh, it didn't uh, really lead to very much because um, each one had his... Um, uh, agenda. So, um, Emperor Villa the Second, if uh, this is uh, where the event we're talking about, had a very belligerent uh, land grabbing policy um, for uh, Germany. And dear Franz Joseph, uh, he was uh, at that time well into his uh, late 60s, if not 70s. 
Um, he was led by uh, the ministers of war who prevailed at that time. And uh, dear Nicholas uh, II, I mean, he was at that time, they, Russia believed that they would conquer and that they were going to be uh, the greatest nation uh, from among the three. And uh, it all turned out very, very differently. All three of them lost their thrones. <laughs> That's very interesting. Now, also, uh, King Frederick Augustus II of Saxony, I just wanted to clarify, There's is Saxony similar to Germany as Monaco is to France? I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. Can you repeat? Sure. Uh, so, King Frederick Augustus II of Saxony, who you were related to, um, Saxony itself, um, it was, Dresden was the capital, right? It was part of yeah. Germany, but it was kind of on its own? Uh, it was, uh, well, before 1871 when um, uh, Prussia became an empire and many of the uh, dukedoms, kingdoms and electric electorates joined um, um, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm I. Um, Dresden, Saxony was... No, not really different. It started off as an electorate, uh, became a kingdom, but not of Saxony, kingdom of Poland, uh, and uh, not kings of, uh, of uh, Saxony. So not really all that different. Um, what happened in Saxony that uh, in 1918, uh, after uh, World War I, uh, the uh, King of Saxony, or the uh, Elector of Saxony, King of Poland, lost his throne um, and uh, was basically um, removed from power and sent, sent, given his marching orders. So um, my grandfather and all his children really... Um, did not uh, um, did not enjoy uh, uh, having all the 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 accoutrements of uh, ruling in uh, in in Saxony at that time. I see. And then, um, right as we enter the conversation about Fabergé, which is. Uh, uh, the key element here. I just want to also bring up the Austro, uh, the Austro-Hungarian monarchy called. Is it correct, Kisilvania? <laughs> no, uh, the Austro-Hungarian uh, monarchy came to be uh, in 1867. Seven. Seven. You said you got me there. Exactly. Transylvania, which is, I think, what you are referring to, was part of Hungary at certain times, and uh, um, therefore um, was was very much part of the whole. Um, uh, I think we better leave that. Okay. That's too complicated. Sounds good. You can. Sure. I've, I've visited Transylvania. I absolutely loved it. Okay. Now let's begin the conversation about Fabergé. There's a new book coming out, your latest of many, called Fabergé Treasures of Imperial Russia. Uh, first publication is by Rizzoli Electa. This book um, is in partnership with the uh, St. Petersburg Fabergé Museum, where the original. Uh, first hen egg is and I'd like to first ask you this question what interested you in Fabergé how did you come to find the beauty of it way back in 1969 I was uh, chairman of Christie's in Switzerland I received a phone call and was asked to go and look at the contents of a house on Lake Geneva and hey presto, there was a large safe in the kitchen with no key. And uh, with the help of a locksmith, I had it broken open and uh, it was full of objects of art by this extraordinary artist about whom I had never heard anything. Remember that I was straight out of university. I knew all about Rembrandt and Michelangelo and uh, Gothic cathedrals. 
Negroes, but Fabergé meant nothing. I had to. That is when I learned to uh, to understand and to love Fabergé because I, when I auctioned those objects uh, in Geneva in 1970, it caused a, a huge stir because these this type of object, no imperial eggs, please, but uh, very beautiful objects of art. Uh, fetched tremendous prices and people traveled from afar in their private planes to come and bid on these objects and that really set me on a career. I think I have traveled 23 times, if not more, to St. Petersburg, studied in the archives, worked together with the directors of museums and their curators. And this has somehow uh, become my entire life. Now, Peter Carl Fabergé, um, did he actually ever create anything himself, or did he oversee the creation by a multitude of artists? Very good question. Uh, he did not. I mean, he was a master of the craft. Uh, he was also a, a master businessman. Uh, but to our knowledge, uh, and there is no proof for him having any made any objects. To our knowledge, he, he actually, as you correctly said, oversaw this entire empire of his, which was spread all, all over Russia, St. Petersburg, Moscow, Kiev, Odessa. And also uh, in Europe, he had a, um, a major outlet in London. Um, the, his empire consisted of over 500 craftsmen who were working for him, primarily in St. Petersburg. Uh, and uh, in Moscow, what Fabergé's role was really that of inventing uh, providing the ideas, probably rough sketches, uh, of the objects that he wished his various workshops to produce. And there were a number of workshops under one roof in St. Petersburg at Bolshaya Morskaya, um, next to St. Isaac's Cathedral. And there these, these 350 craftsmen would, would uh, first of all, uh, create uh, detailed designs of what Fabergé had in mind and then these things were executed in the various workshops under his direct uh, uh, care. There's a nice little story uh, which uh, um, describes Fabergé uh, in the middle of this vast house which still exists today with a hammer in his hand and uh, each object would have to be submitted to him for his approval. And if he thought that this was not up to the quality and standards of what he demanded, the hammer would come down and smash the object. <laughs> just like, and, just like Thor. Story, I don't believe it for a minute, but it does really uh, uh, exemplify um, the standard, the high standard that this firm had under Fabergé of producing the most perfect, most exquisite objects of their time. That's, you know, talk about this show being called Archetypal Mosaic, that directly relates to the archetype of Thor, which was right, uh, you know, ge geographically located pretty close to St. Petersburg, interestingly enough. Um, now, back to... Uh, so he, if he was the architect, was he also, as you mentioned, the quality control person? So he was there at the beginning and at the end, correct, of each production? That is very well put, yes, exactly. Okay, great. Now, um, I've had the pleasure, since I'm from St. Petersburg, to, to see a lot of the original eggs, both in the Moscow Armory and the Virginia Museum when it came to Vegas, and... Um, in Ohio and many other locations. Uh, tell me, my favorite egg probably would be the Peter the Great egg. Um, um, what are some of your favorite eggs and why? <laughs> A difficult choice. Maybe one should first of all explain what these eggs were because uh, they were really, truly uh, 
a totally out of the ordinary series of objects. Well, we know that uh, 50 of them were commissioned, uh, two were not uh, completed. Uh, the first egg was 1885. The last completed egg uh, was uh, 1916. Two eggs uh, were in work in 1917, but were never delivered to the Tsar. Of those uh, 50 eggs, uh, the first 10 were made uh, um, uh, for, uh, as commissions of Tsar Alexander III as Easter presents for his wife, uh, Alexandra Fyodorovna, who was a born princess of Denmark. So that accounts for 10. Uh, his son, Alexander's son, Nicholas II, continued the tradition, but he uh, commissioned two eggs every year, uh, namely one for his, his wife, a German princess of uh, Hessen, Alexandra Fedorovna, and for his mother. So his mother, Maria Fedorovna, ended up with the largest collection uh, of all. Um, and what happened in 1917 was that Nicholas II was forced to abdicate. All the eggs were at that time still in the imperial palaces in St. Petersburg, in the private apartments of uh, the Tsar um, and Tsarina. And what happened then is that the uh, Bolshevik uh, state, the new republic in 1917, seized all these treasures uh, and sent them to Moscow for uh, safekeeping. Keeping. This is the Russian Revolution where many, many pieces were destroyed and, um, and, and lost and stolen. So all the eggs, with the exception of eight, which disappeared at that time, so 42 of the eggs were sent to Moscow and kept in the Kremlin until 19. 23, when the Russians started considering these objects of art as possible objects that could be sold uh, to the West. The, the Russians at that time, the Bolsheviks, had absolutely no interest whatsoever in these treasures and would have sold their own grandmothers, I think. Uh, we're talking of 1918, 1920. Uh, there was a huge famine in Russia at that time. Lenin's first five-year plan was not working. They needed desperate money to, uh, to uh, finance uh, industrial equipment, tractors and so on, to be able to uh, move the economy along. So with that, uh, all the eggs, with the exception of all the 40 eggs, with the exception of 10, which are today in the Moscow Armory Museum, were sold to the West. Now, um, but wh what would be some of your favorites? Uh, my favorite, I understand your, your, your uh, love for the Peter the Great Egg of 2003. That's, that's, I, I have held it in my hands. Um, Many, many a time, as I have heard, held almost every single one of uh, uh, Faberge's eggs in my hands, I may be one of the very, very few people, maybe the only person oh. who has had this 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 honor. Uh, my favorite piece um, is the winter egg, which is uh, was commissioned in 1913 by the Tsar, by Nicholas. Um, and it is uh, a rock crystal egg. It consists of three pieces of rock crystal, uh, two forming the shell of the uh, egg itself, and the base being uh, a rock crystal which is carved to simulate mel a melting ice flow. And both the upper pieces and the base um, are encrusted with tiny, tiny 
um, a, 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 a diamond set in platinum rivulets. And inside, if you, when it opens, it has a basket of spring flowers. Now, this object was had disappeared in 1949, was last seen, and reappeared uh, in the... Uh, when was it in the 90s uh, um, and came up for auction at the world record price then, came up for, uh, in New York at auction and fetched the world record price then, uh, $9.6 million then. And today is owned by a, um, uh, a mid Middle Eastern potentate. And I've asked this gentleman, um, how much he would accept for the egg. I said, would you accept, I don't know, 30 million? <laughs> he smiled, 40. He smiled even <laughs> more broadly. I said, 50? <laughs> he said, no. <laughs> wow. It's not for sale. <laughs> Amazing. So that, that, I think, is the most brilliant of all the eggs because it's made out of nothing <laughs> and is worth that kind of money. That's that's an exquisite story. Um, now, objects of virtu, does that symbolize mostly Italian objects of virtuoso, pretty much? Is that where the term comes from? And how does that relate to the other Fabergé objects? For example, in the armory in Moscow, there's so many intricate, exquisite little flowers and things that when one sees them, one imagines, like, how is that even possible to make? They're so refined. How do they last? How do they not break? It's just amazing. <laughs> yeah, uh, good, 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 good comment. Uh, what very few people know is that the imperial Easter eggs, I mentioned that there were 50 of them, represents less than 1% of what the Fabergé firm produced. We know that uh, over 350,000 objects were made by the firm, and each one, one of a kind. Now, there was a lot of silver, which the Bolsheviks all melted down, so there's very little of it left. There was a lot of jewelry, which the Bolsheviks broke up and sold for the value uh, of their stones. So a very little of that is left, but what is left is what you described, flowers and little animals uh, and the objects of art, objects of virtue. And the good question to ask is, why have these survived as opposed to all the rest of Fabergé's pieces? And the answer is very simple, because these objects were of smallish intrinsic value. The semi-precious stones that form many of them, the animals, flowers, and many of the objects of virtue were inexpensive and are still inexpensive. So what you are buying is, uh, or what you are looking at, and what is so extraordinary, because so unique, is this genius of Fabergé, who, together with his uh, brother, Agathon, his four sons, uh, his design studio, uh, invented and created and oversaw the production of all these tens of thousands of objects, and each one one of a kind. So um, they have survived for that very reason, because people collect collected them then, and the Bolsheviks saw that there was a demand for them and did not destroy these objects. Uh, the Americans were large buyers of these objects of virtue, these objects of art, as were the Brits and uh, many other countries, because they are truly so unique and so marvelous. It would be amazing, it would have been amazing, and it would be amazing if anything like this ever happens again, if there's always two pieces created, one for the party requesting and one for the archives, so that nothing can ever be fully destroyed. Um, tell me, um, now, 
the first hen the first egg was the original hen egg which is a white egg and inside is a small hen and inside is a small pendant now that pendant is the egg is currently in the st petersburg faberge museum the pendant has been lost um have you held that first egg because i have a very strong interest in that egg just just it's so interesting you know and when you held it did it give you any kind of archetypal feeling this is the first this is the the original <laughs> one special vibes uh what i love about that egg well you describe it correctly but you have missed out that there is uh in uh, the, the outside is a white shell <laughs> Uh, made out of enamel. Uh, the inside is uh, is uh, is a uh, is a further egg, but is the yolk of the egg. So it's made of gold. That opens up, and uh, there is a hen inside it. The hen opened up, and there was a crown inside. It. And inside of the crown was uh, this uh, ruby drop. And if you bear with me, there's a fascinating correspondence between um, Grant, uh, between Tsar Alexander III and his brother, um, Grand Duke Vladimir, about this egg, and this is, as, is not very well known because it's never been published. Hmm. And Alexander writes to his brother, I am grateful to you, dear Vladimir, for the trouble you have taken in placing the order and for the execution of the order itself which could not have been more successful. The workmanship is really very fine and exquisite. Your instructions for the delicate handling of the objects are so explicit uh, that I was able to carry them out easily and with complete success. I hope that the egg, which was which cost more than the whole, uh, this little uh, 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 ruby drop, um, which costs more than the whole egg. I do hope that the egg will have the desired effect on its future owner. So that is where it all started. And as you correctly say, I mean, this object uh, absolutely charmed the Empress Maria Fyodorovna and set off this extraordinary series. Uh, of objects which uh, stand absolutely uh, as one of a kind objects uh, created by one jewel of 50 objects. Imagine the challenge each year of producing one and then two objects. Uh, none were allowed to be duplicates. So they each one had to be invented uh, on its own and what the, uh, the Tsar um, uh, insisted upon is that the, 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 the eggs were not to have any political uh, or uh, historical um, uh, meaning. They were all to, to, to show events in the personal lives of the Tsar and Tsarina. So often you find the children shown uh, in miniatures or the yachts in which they used to go on holiday or the train in which they used to uh, travel around, the palaces in which they live. Uh, all of these are depicted as the surprises of uh, these eggs. Quite, quite, quite magical, I have to say. Do you know if uh, the Fabergé brand ever created crowns for any of the royals? Uh, crowns, um, uh, the, the crowns that were worn by the royals were made by other jewelers. Uh, there was Bolin and there was Han. They made crowns which were worn at coronation ceremonies, but Fabergé made diadems and necklaces and mm -hmm. you name it. Um, there's one, um, uh, one um, album of designs which has 4,000 jewelry designs. All of these pieces, or virtually all, have been destroyed and lost. But uh, they exemplify, they show what an extraordinary jewel of Fabergé also was. Now tell me, is there, do you think there's anything comparable to Fabergé in the world or ever has been? Because in my taste, Fabergé is number one. <laughs> I'm 
absolutely. I share your opinion totally. Uh, you might speak of uh, great jewelers like Cartier or Boucheron uh, or Tiffany. Funny, there's a, there, there is a, a, an amusing anecdote about Fabergé being interviewed in 1914 about those specific three jewelers. <laughs> And uh, he, he said, kind of looking down as those one imagines, he said, Tiffany, Cartier, and Boucheron are people of commerce. <laughs> Meaning that, uh, and, and saying so, if you wish to buy a million dollar, a million ruble necklace uh, of diamonds and of pearls, that's where you go. But I am the artist craftsman and that's where he stands out a mile and is totally utterly different others try to copy him uh, imitate him uh, but none succeeded now not too long ago there was a Fabergé egg found in a some kind of a yard sale or something of that nature <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I was wondering you know uh, how how likely is that? Of course, it's it's highly unlikely, but how likely is that? And how likely is it possibly to be counterfeit? Uh, well, I've held this piece in my hands, and uh, it too is just incredibly beautifully crafted. Uh, the 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 one thing that sort of uh, um, proved its authenticity is that a photograph of 1902 uh, shows that egg in a showcase um, of an exhibition which Fabergé held at that time. And um, there are counterfeits, there are many counterfeits, uh, but um, uh, it's you cannot really reach the the, the reach incredible that. quality uh, and originality of the things that that, that Fabergé made. So this egg was really a, a great story. Uh, it was in all the papers. Is that the scrap metal dealer went to a midwestern. Um, a yard, well, yard sale, I don't know if it was a yard sale, but anyhow, um, and saw this piece and weighed it uh, in his hands and he, and he bought it for $14,000, not knowing what it was, it had no signature or anything, so um, nobody knew what it was, and he bought it for the value of the, of the gold. And he tried to sell it on to chums of his um, for the value of the gold. And they said, you've overpaid it. Uh, but he, he, the incredible story then went that uh, it was one of, it turned out to be one of the missing eight eggs in uh, 1917. Um, and... Uh, um, he went online and found an article which described one of these missing eggs and uh, had it checked out and uh, 20 million British pounds later, uh, he was a happy man. That That is an exquisite story. You know, the markings and the signatures is an interesting point because most Fabergé items, they have the Russian F, they have the workmaster's symbol, and they have the the marking for the metal used. Is that correct? About three markings a piece? Yes, that's correct. And um, so uh, those markings are so essential and, and they prove so much. Um, when there is a piece without a marking, um, how how is that even possible that it came through the shop without quality control, without the marking? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, the egg in question was one of the early ones, so which Fabergé didn't sign. It had uh, the hallmark of uh, one of the uh, makers of Fabergé, um, and but nobody really noticed that. Nobody knew that it was Russian. It had a Russian Constantin watch in it. Um, but the answer to your question is that. The hallmark means nothing. Hmm. 
meaning that all the forgeries are hallmarked mm. and extremely well. So never, never um, buy a piece because it is hallmarked. Because uh, many of the of the authentic pieces are not hallmarked or have lost their hallmarks um, or only have the marks of a maker, not Fabergé, but one of his workmasters. So unless you know your history of Fabergé well enough, you wouldn't uh, know. Uh, and um, that is a word of warning to all those out there that the hallmark means nothing because uh, whether it's by laser technique or by whatever means you can transfer marks from genuine objects to uh, forgeries. And um, there you are. I've been shown hundreds, maybe tens of thousands of objects. Uh, I've sent e uh, email image, uh, images by email almost every day. Of objects which are made either in uh, New York or in uh, Russia or elsewhere, which I can tell immediately um, that that is a forgery. I know uh, the workshops in which these things are made. I know uh, the colors that Fabergé used and the forgers don't know about. Uh, the shapes that Fabergé used and the forgers don't necessarily know about. So uh, it is. Um, it it's 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 it, it takes forty years of expertise of learning and seeing uh, these objects, both genuine and forgeries, um, for one to be able, one to have the gut feeling that is necessary to identify what is good from that. The discernment. You definitely have the extraordinary discernment. Um, I'm sorry. Um, we may have to redo that just a second. That was my answering phone. Um, I was talking... So, uh, do we need to go back on something? No, no, we're fine. I was saying you have great discernment, and that's the key. Um, I want to ask you a few more questions. Now, cleaning. Let's say... You know, a Fabergé egg, a real one, is sitting in a beautiful, you know, glass structure in a house, and it has dust on it, or you know, accidentally the cat touched it or something. What is? What are the best ways of cleaning a real egg? Uh, cleaning. It depends on what it's made of. Uh, if it's just pure gold, I mean, you, you treat them as gently as possible. Uh, and you don't use any acids or anything. Um, I would use a toothbrush and soap, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so um, normally for eggs that have that kind of value, it's best left to professionals to do that. And um, in the future, since Fabergé has been rebranded and has a new... Uh, new presence recently uh, ha has always had kind of transitionary presences, but now is also making objects of virtue. Um, do you believe that further eggs, future eggs, which can be commissioned, could become part of the history of Fabergé? Uh, yes, but there is this 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 clear. Uh, divide between what was made uh, before 1917, uh, before the Russian Revolution, and what has been made since. Uh, what I find that I, I, I act as um, as advisor to the present day uh, company is that quality can be equaled. Uh, design uh, is much more difficult, but what is made since the revolution is in a, in a separate class. That having been said, the pieces that are being made now by the Fabergé company, uh, they are exquisite, they are jeweled uh, with colored stones, and etc. We have uh, um, uh, designed uh, and created uh, a pearl mm -hmm. egg for a Middle Eastern uh, collector. 
uh, which uh, is set with the most exquisite pearls, uh, I find that these can be considered the equivalent of what Fabergé would have become uh, today. I think that many of the things created by the Fabergé company today uh, would have made Fabergé proud. They're different in style, and there are many people who look down on them, but uh, objectively I find that they are, uh, they are, uh, they are quite extraordinary objects of art and jewels. You know, I actually have designed my own eggs, and at the right time, if I ever can, I will have a commission by Fabergé. <laughs> um, <laughs> May I correct you on one thing? I don't know where you can fit that in, is that the the book about the uh, about the Fabergé Museum, uh, which is owned by Victor Wechselberg, uh, the great um, um, uh, billionaire who, um, uh, who acquired the Pope's magazine collection. Some of your listeners may remember that when it was in uh, New York, uh, is now part of this museum in St. Petersburg. Um, and uh, one, uh, a group of objects which are part of uh, a collection of about a thousand pieces of Fabergé, um, uh, larger than any other uh, in the world. And this catalogue is actually a, a work uh, of a number of uh, of the best Fabergé specialists who have written this. We are the advisory uh, board of the Fabergé Museum, um, and we have written this this book together uh, in homage of this great museum and this great collection. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. That is, uh, dear audience, this is about the February 2018 publishing of the book called Fabergé, Treasures of Imperial Russia, which at the time of this recording is currently number one in its category. Uh, so go ahead and pre-order or order that book because as... Uh, Dr. Habsburg has stated himself and uh, the people who know it best have all contributed to this book. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share with the audience? Just that, uh, that Fabergé is truly the greatest. I, I'm, <laughs> it's funny that I should find myself saying this. Uh, so often that he is truly the, the greatest, uh, most unique jeweler uh, who ever lived and who together with his craftsmen created objects of art which are totally unique. Uh, for those who live in the New York area, uh, there's a collection of Fabergé at the Metropolitan Museum, uh, privately owned, uh, which has three of the Imperial Easter eggs uh, as highlights. The museums in, uh, uh, in Hillwood, Washington, and in uh, Baltimore have uh, uh, special Fabergé exhibitions and publications uh, for um, what is uh, this particular month with the appearance of these three catalogues of these three exhibitions is truly uh, an extraordinary moment and please go online and check, check these books out on these collections uh, because they, uh, you will be utterly amazed. And may I ask you uh, about Fabergé and your personal collection? Do you personally like to collect Fabergé objects, or have you, or are you commissioning your own objects as well? <laughs> um, I have used the Fabergés that I had uh, to put my three sons through college. Oh, great. Um, and I'm left with one one single piece, which is an ashtray, which I don't use, uh, but uh, I can't afford them. <laughs> they, are, <laughs> they have become truly very expensive, and I've played my part in driving up these prices. Yeah, I love it. Um, well, I really appreciate you being on the show. Again, a thank you to Your Royal and Imperial Highness, 
PhD Dr. Geza von Habsburg for this extraordinary insightful look into both Fabergé and some extensive family history. You're very welcome.